and my name is Raman Bedi. I'm based here in London and at King's College London. Linda, welcome and thank you so much for uh, agreeing to give this lecture. Uh, can I just hand over to you? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Prof. Bedi. Thank you for inviting me to this session. And uh, may I introduce myself here? Um, I'm Linda Kusdani. I'm from the Prosthodontic Department, Faculty of Dentistry, Universitas Indonesia. It is in Indonesia. And um, yeah, and I, I'm majoring in prosthodontic and also in geriatric uh, dentistry. Can I start the presentation, Prof. Betty? Yes, please. Yes, please. Do start. Okay. Uh, I, I will share my screen. Is it uh, already? Uh, this is fine. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Professor Bedi, and also good evening uh, to uh, Prof. Kalum and uh, Dr. Jacobs. Uh, thank you for inviting me here to share about uh, the topic of oral health care in medically compromised patients, especially neurodegenerative and respiratory disorder. And uh, before I starting my presentation, I want to introduce my uh, country, Indonesia. Indonesia is a very uh, beautiful country, consists of um, not only island, but also mountains and also rice field. So I hope you all can visit uh, Indonesia if the pandemic is over. And this is... Uh, our Faculty of Dentistry, Universitas Indonesia. We have two campus uh, uh, for the undergraduate uh, students. We have the campus in a uh, rural area in uh, West Java. This is uh, our uh, campus. And then the second campus is in the central of Jakarta. It is, uh, it is also the location of our dental hospital. And uh, this is our dental hospital. And uh, I recorded this uh, picture in the pandemic uh, COVID-19 situation. And the uh, students treat the, the, the patient using the protocol for the COVID-19. Yeah, I want to uh, start my presentation. Uh, the first thing that I want to share is about the older people population. And uh, an increase of proportion of older population uh, due to the increase of life expectancy, it, it is also gave impact that there is an increased number of older population with systemic disease and degenerative disorder. And according to the WHO, if the proportion of older population is more than 7%, we call it the aging society. And if it is more than 14%, we uh, enter the age society. And if the proportion is more than 21%, it is a super age society. And what about in Indonesia? In Indonesia, uh, in 2035, it is predicted that uh, it is predicted that uh, Indonesia will have the proportion of older person around 13.8%. So it means Indonesia is entering the age society. And um, in Indonesia in 2035, it is predicted that we will have uh, around 48.1 million uh, older persons. It means that uh, double uh, the proportion of older person in 2017. And I think it is uh, syn uh, synergized with the uh, increase of older, pro uh, older person pro uh, proportion in the world. And uh, what I want to talk now is about the medically compromised patient. Uh, the term medically compromised refers to dental patient with impaired health status and patient with systemic disease and patient with altered human system. And about the neurodegenerative disorder, the, uh, the disease that I want to uh, take um, uh, stressing, it is a range of condition with this primary effect, the neuron in the human brain. And 
uh, example of this uh, neurodegenerative disease is Parkinson disease and Alzheimer disease and incurable and debilitating condition and will result in progressive of degeneration, death of nerve cell and problem with movement, we call it ataxia and problem with mental functioning and call it dementia. And neurologic degenerative disease like Alzheimer disease and Parkinson disease usually occurs in older person or in elderly. And uh, cognitive impairment, it is a common condition among the older adults and the mild cognitive impairment. It is an intermediate stage between the normal aging and the dementia. And it is considered as a pre-dementia syndrome. And the probability of the mild cognitive impairment in adults to progressing to dementia is higher than adult without the mild cognitive impairment. So it is important to identify the risk factor of the mild cognitive impairment in order to delay the onset and decline of the cognitive impairment. And dementia is a syndrome that results in progressive deterioration of cortical functioning, including language, judgment, comprehension, memory, thinking, and learning. And as dementia advances, the person's ability to carry out activities of daily living, such as uh, going to shopping, managing finance, it, it will also decline and eventually resulting in the person needing assistance to undertake even a simple activities. And Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia and accounts for more than 50% of dementia cases. And the most consistent risk factor for dementia is age, family history, and then stroke, diabetes, obesity, high cholesterol, hypertension, low physical activity, and low education. And this is the uh, map of uh, aging of the global population uh, with the proportion of the chronic degenerative disease, including dementia. It is shown that in Asia, uh, the, the proportion is about 22.9 million of, uh, of the older person who afflict with dementia. And uh, it is the highest number uh, compared to other region in the world. And it's, so it is very important for us who live in Asia to take notes of this uh, degenerative disease. Dementia, uh, about the prevalence of dementia, uh, the number of people living with dementia worldwide, uh, it, it is estimated will be reached around 135.46. 46 million in 2050. And in the Asia Pacific region, the number of people with dementia uh, in 2050 will about uh, 71 million. So it means that more than half of the people with dementia worldwide will live in Asia. And uh, the impact of dementia uh, dementia and cognitive impairment, uh, as I already mentioned, are the leading chronic disease contributors to disability and dependence among older people worldwide. And um, it means that uh, people living with dementia will increasingly have difficulty to meet their basic personal care needs. And uh, the best way to prevent the mild cognitive impairment to become uh, severe, to become dementia, is that uh, prevention is, uh, is the very important thing. So we should raise awareness of prevention and risk reduction strategies, which may delay the onset of the disease for some individuals and reduce future numbers of people with dementia. And uh, optimum quality of life for older person can be achieved not only by taking notice of general health condition, but also by taking consideration of oral health. And according to the WHO, oral health is an integral and essential to general health. And also it is a de determinant factor for a quality of life. And um, recent systematic review found that uh, elderly people with dementia 
will have higher incidence of coronal and root caries, periodontal problems such as pingival bleeding, periodontitis, attachment loss, stereostomia, oral lesion, and uncomfortable danger fit. And uh, we have a previous study in Indonesia, and we found that the number of missing teeth uh, it is a risk factor for low cognitive function and dementia. And it may be the result of the reduced nutritional intake that comes with having only few teeth. And the data from Indonesia drew an association between fewer teeth and worse memory. Feeding and lack of nutrition contribute to the memory decline. Food high in folate and cobalt amines such as green leafy vegetables, bean, meat are often not easy to chew. Uh, so this consumption may be reduced in the presence of oral disease or in the presence of tooth loss. And uh, interest has grown in the association among tooth loss, periodontal disease, and dementia. And tooth loss is a common indicator of poor oral health. And uh, the impaired masticatory will affect nutritional in intake and may lead to reduce cere cerebral stimulation and also reduce blood flow, thus favoring the development or worsening of the dementia. And it is a, a one of a very interesting uh, paper about the association between tooth loss and cognitive decline. It is a 13 year longitudinal study of Chinese older adults. And from this uh, study, uh, it is concluded that a uh, participant who had fewer teeth tended to show a quicker pace of cognitive decline in Chinese older adults. And uh, uh, this is uh, another study uh, done, uh, it is a collaborative study done by uh, our students and uh, it is a collaborative with Lobro University in UK about the impact of using nature on cognitive function of the, of the elderly. And uh, the result of this study showed that an uh, increase of cognitive status and mastication ability, both for the danger group and the control group at follow up. Uh, uh, and it shows that the pre-prosthetic treatment alone before the danger treatment already gave positive impact to cognitive function due to better oral health. Uh, so in this study, we, uh, we divided uh, two groups. One is the danger group, uh, uh, and then the second is the control group. The, uh, the control group uh, will have the pre-prosthetic treatment alone, and then after the study finished, uh, they continue with the danger treatment. But the danger uh, group uh, uh, have a pre-prosthetic treatment and followed directly uh, by the danger treatment. So from this study, uh, using danger, uh, it means that it will give occlusal contact to brain function. And then uh, mastication is effective in sending enormous amount of sensory information to the brain and maintaining learning and memory function of the hippocampus. And from this study, we uh, also learned that after pre-prosthetic treatment, subjects feel free of pain, so they can masticate with comfort, regardless or whether or not they continued with the danger treatment. So it means that the better oral health condition due to the pre-prosthetic treatment, such as scaling, uh, filling, and then extraction of residual dental root, can give a positive impact for the patient cognitive function. And it is also support the result of our previous study uh, that showed that a uh, that oral hygiene is related to cognitive function. And uh, this is another study do, uh, done by our PhD students about the periodontal parameters in the Indonesian elderly and in association with the cognitive impairment. And from this study, we, uh, there, it is showed that there were a significant difference in the plaque indices, oral hygiene index, papillary bleeding index and pocket depth, and also gingivalization, attachment loss and tooth loss between cognitive normal and, co and uh, cognitive impaired subjects. And uh, there were significant correlation between all periodontal parameters and cognitive function. 
And this study indicates that poorly for dental health is significantly associated with cognitive impairment. And this is uh, another, um, uh, I think it is a very interesting uh, charts about the uh, pathway from periodont periodontitis. Uh, it, it is, they have a uh, three direction. First, uh, uh, from periodontitis uh, will affect the masticatory dysfunction and it will affect uh, to decrease cerebral blood flow and it will affect uh, the severity from mild cognitive impairment to dementia or similar disease. And uh, another pathway is from periodontitis to tooth loss. And then this will affect the hippocampus and then uh, to uh, increase the severity from mild cognitive impairment to dementia. And then another pathway is from uh, periodontitis is to chronic inflammation. And it is also uh, will have effect to uh, the severity of the mild cognitive impairment to become dementia. And uh, what is uh, the importance of oral care for elder, elder people or older person with dementia or Alzheimer's Alzheimer disease? Uh, there's two things that uh, we, make, we must take concern. The first one is aspiration pneumonia. It is a misdirection of oropharyngeal or gastric contents into the pulmonary parenchyme. And it is common type of lung infection and may cause uh, elderly death. And it is crucial to, to improve the oral hygiene status of the older person with dementia or Alzheimer's disease to lower their risk of suffering from aspiration pneumonia. And the second is malnutrition. Malnutrition associated with poor oral health and compromise oral health in elder people impairs the sensory and masticatory function and will affect the nutritional intake. And uh, about the dental care for patients with neurodegenerative disorders, uh, elder people should establish daily oral hygiene care routine during the early states of disease. Uh, they, has, they should have a regular dental examination and then early minimal intervention to prevent uh, the need for more complicated procedures. And because elderly people might forget or lose interest in keeping their teeth healthy. So it is very important to, uh, to ask the care, caretakers and community health workers to help them to take over this task. And also dentists should provide guidance on the maintenance of oral health, uh, such as the technique used to provide this uh, support for the very uh, depending on elderly people concert. And uh, about the program that we have to uh, give for the uh, patient with the neurodegenerative disorder, the first one is the preventive programs. It is important for both preventing dental disease and maintaining uh, self-care. And, um, and in terms of self-care, we, we should uh, give uh, education to the patient, uh, consists of oral hygiene instruction, dietary advice, and also must be tailored to individual circumstances of the patient, such as uh, dexterity or the memory issues. And also we should include uh, educating the caretakers or caregivers to help with the maintaining of oral health. And the second is maintain the dental status with the simple treatment. It means that used uh, professional treatments should be considered and to avoid complicated treatments and use the automatic restorative te technique. And the third one is uh, the emergency care uh, to specify uh, the one with give discomfort or pain for the patient. And uh, for the cognitive impaired older adults, uh, regular preventive oral hygiene care is maybe a challenging task. And uh, it is uh, more complicated due to a reduce of physical dexterity and impaired sensory function and difficulty in communication. And uh, sometimes the, uh, the patient already take medications such as antidepressant and antipsychotics 
and it will give uh, adverse oral effects such as uh, maybe serostomia and decrease of salivary flow. And uh, there's also uh, dyskinesia or extra pyramidal symptoms. And um, adequate oral hygiene and dental treatment are needed for people with dementia to prevent medical problems like I previously said that such as aspiration pneumonia and to maintain the adequate nutrition and hydration. And uh, it is a, uh, that it is a very uh, interesting uh, paper said that that healthy oral cavity and satisfactory mastication efficiency, clean aesthetic dentition, and also prosthesis will contribute to the quality of like the older person. And the underlying contributive factor is to make nutritional intake is possible and keeping the body healthy and functioning well. And now I can proceed. Uh, now I want to proceed with the second uh, disease about the Parkinson disease. Parkinson disease is a complex and heterogeneous disorder with motor and non-motor symptoms and uh, with also environmental and genetic risk factors and several affected brain structures and cellular function. And the prevalence, 1% uh, uh, in people uh, 60 years or older and, uh, and equating to between seven and nine million of elderly in the world suffer from this disorder. And patients with Parkinson's disease are with higher, will have a higher risk for developing oral health problems that can exacerbate by non, other non-motor symptoms such as uh, mental health and also dysphagia. And this will accelerate accelerates the decline in quality of life and even increase the risk of death by aspiration of pneumonia. And um, non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease may appear years before or after diagnosis, including uh, changes in behavioral and cognitive, and also uh, autonomic dysfunction such as dysphagia or sleep-related dysfunction. And uh, it is... Uh, very uh, uh, nice uh, charts about the Parkinson disease uh, that can give effect to the can give uh, cognitive symptoms and then motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms and also this will increase risk uh, to have uh, the patient to have a poor oral health and with the poor oral health it was it will increase the risk of, for social impairment and uh, also the aspiration pneumonia. And for uh, taking care of uh, the Parkinson's disease patient, uh, we should have an interprofessional healthcare team, not only consists of uh, dentists, but also caregiver, uh, neurologists, nurses, physical therapists, psychologists, speech pathologists, dietitian, and other specialists needed. And uh, oral health concerns in patients with Parkinson's disease, uh, from higher rates of carious and periodontal disease, and then difficulty to retaining their dangers, uh, susceptibility to crack their teeth due to bruxism and masticatory problems because they cannot um, control the, motors, uh, the motor function, and then the shallow ray and orofacial pain, uh, burning mouth syndrome, and serostomia, and also taste impairment. And uh, Major oral health concern is tooth and gingival loss, serostomia, decrease of salivary flow rate, and also excessive drawing and dysphagia. Uh, I want to explain uh, one by one of uh, the disorder. One of this is serostomia. Serostomia is a subjective complaint of dry mouth and can uh, cause uh, demineralization of tooth enamel and rapid tooth decay, and also severe oral infection, dehydration of the gingiva, and loss of uh, salivary antimicrobial protection. And to uh, overcome the symptoms, patients should be encouraged to take frequent sips of water and eat moist food, uh, use lip balms and artificial saliva, and also chew sugar-free gum. And a sufficient daily intake of water is important. And it is recommended 
uh, intake of one until 1.5 liter of water per day. And also uh, we can also uh, prescribe bilocarpine to for other uh, adult with reduced salivary flow. And uh, excessive drawing. Uh, patient with advanced Parkinson's disease uh, with the decreased salivary flow rate, I mean, many of them experience excessive drawing. And uh, excessive drawing can cause perioral dermatitis and then uh, will also affect of oral hygiene, produce bad breath, and, and then in, increase the amount of oral bacteria impair eating and speaking and uh, put the patient at higher risk for uh, aspiration or of saliva leading to respiratory tract infection. Dysphagia, uh, poor oral facial muscle control and complex to posture may contribute to the excessive drawing. And I think a dental health professional can help uh, to detect these drawing problems and to prevent further oral health decline. And the second is dysphagia. Dysphagia is difficulty in swallowing. And the symptom is associated with weight loss, malnutrition, dehydration, social impairment, and poor psychological well being and risk of death through aspiration pneumonia. And the increased retention time of food material along, along the swallowing tract will promote bacterial growth and uh, also teeth or gingival deterioration and uh, increase the chains of aspiration pneumonia and also uh, uh, increased rate of mortality. And it is a very, uh, uh, I think it's very simple questionnaire. Uh, it calls the it 10 uh, to, uh, to, to measure the risk of a patient to have a, a deterioration of swallowing function. It consists of 10 questions uh, uh, about the patient, uh, whether they have a difficulty in swallowing. And if the it 10 score is three or higher, uh, it means that uh, the patient have a, a dysphagia. So I think it is a very uh, useful tool for screening uh, just for screening the, the patient with uh, swallowing problems. And, uh, and then uh, the, complete, the complete interprofessional healthcare team is needed, as I previously uh, mentioned. And then we can also advise the patient to eat small bites and then avoid eating and drinking simultaneously to decrease the risk for aspiration. And because the dysphagia is greatly linked to oral health, it is important for the dentist to be aware of this problem. And then maybe uh, we have uh, interprofessional teams to overcome this condition. And uh, for the dental care for patients with Parkinson's disease, uh, I think uh, we should maintain it uh, the good oral hygiene and then keeping a low sugar diet and uh, making a regular visit to the dentist is a must. And then uh, dentists should also uh, survey the patient regularly and then they must uh, concern the symptom of the Parkinson's disease that may affect uh, the oral health care, such as the tremor of the severity and then it will also affect uh, uh, whether the patient can brush their teeth. And then uh, it is also uh, will affect the sugar consumption because the patient uh, will choose uh, maybe soft diet. And then uh, there is also um, salivary problems such as drooling or dry mouth and also dysphagia. And uh, then this should recommend the use of electric toothbrush or uh, toothbrush with a large handheld or using water irrigation to help with the dental care. And then uh, also uh, we must take consideration that patient with Parkinson's disease may not be able to communicate uh, their need uh, effectively. So uh, family member or caregivers should be present when the treatment plan is presented to the patient. Uh, now uh, I want to uh, continue with the respiratory disorder. 
uh, it is a disease of lung and human airways that affect human aspiration. And uh, first types of infection, allergies, and other disease related to the different organ tissue and especially cell of human respiratory system. And uh, types of respiratory system disorders consist of four. The one is that will affect the airway disease. It affects the bronchial tubes. And in airway disease, the passage for air is reduced which is associated with narrowing or blocking the bron bronchial tubes. And then the second is the lung tissue disease. Uh, human lungs are covered by a thin tissue layer called pleura. And due to certain viral or bacterial infection, the structures of the lung tissue are affected. And then uh, which result in scarring or there's an inflammation of this tissue and that uh, enabled the lung to expand normally. And then it will make the, the, uh, the breathing is difficult. And the third one is the lung circulation disease. This disorder occurs when the blood vessel of the lung are coagulated, swollen or damaged. And this affects the ability of the lung to receive oxygen and release carbon dioxide. And in extreme cases, this order may affect the functioning of the heart. And uh, the respiratory disorder, which are commonly prevalent, is the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or we call it COPD, and asthma, and also tuberculosis. And uh, COPD is uh, irreversible and slowly progressing disorder and characterized by a limitation of airway flow and resulting from abnormal pulmonary inflammatory reaction to harmful gas or particles such as tobacco smoke. And example of the COPD are chronic bronchitis and lung emphysema. And then uh, the second is asthma. Asthma is a syndrome of uh, episodic reversible acute narrowing of airway bronchospasm. And there's a constriction of smooth muscle with them of the bronchial mucose and formation of mucose. Uh, the precipitators uh, can be stressed called air pollutant respiratory infection. And uh, the last thing is tuberculosis. It is a chronic infectious granulomatous disease uh, mainly caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. It is a acid fast bacillus that is transmitted through the respiratory route through uh, inhalation of infected airborne droplets and containing the bacillus tuberculosis. And the main sign and symptoms of this disease is uh, persistent cuts and then blood in sputum and nocturnal perspiration, weight loss, fever, anorexia, or combination of this uh, manifestation. And what about the oral manifestation of that uh, respiratory disorder? And uh, oral bacteria that colonize in the oropharynx may be aspirated through the lower respiratory tract, and particularly in individual at high risk of infection. And salivary enzyme associated with periodontal disease may modify the mucosa surface along the respiratory tract and then this facilitating colonization by pathogens. And uh, hydrolytic uh, enzymes such as a result of periodontal disease also may destroy salivary films and inhibit bacteria elimination and thus promoting the possibility of aspiration of this pathogen into the lung. And inflammatory molecules present in saliva may modify the respiratory ep epithelium and promote colonization of the respiratory pathogen. And so uh, improved oral hygiene and frequent professional oral care is uh, very needed for uh, to prevent uh, the worsening condition and to uh, help uh, not to become uh, aspiration pneumonia. So uh, uh, improve oral hygiene, we reduce the progression on, of or occurrence of respiratory disease in high-risk elderly adults and living in nursing home and especially those in intensive care units. And oral hygiene and frequent professional oral health care 
will reduce the occurrence of pneumonia among high-risk elderly people living in nursing home in ICU. It is a very interesting uh, uh, result of a study uh, from Asar Fuzut and et al. And, uh, uh, and in general, uh, for oral care for medically compromised patients, it means that not only the neurodegenerative and also a with a patient with respiratory disorder, uh, the preventive component is a very uh, important thing. Uh, the first one is mechanical plaque removal using a toothbrush and uh, with light pressure. And then sometimes it is needed to uh, uh, use um, uh, for patient with manual dexterity to use uh, electric brass and then uh, or uh, manual brass that have been uh, customized for its persons and also using rinse like uh, chlorhexidine rinses uh, uh, it is uh, indicated for gingivitis and against a variety of black bacteria and also fluorides and uh, remineralizing rinse or topical fluoride. It is used in elder person uh, who continually experience new coronal or root carrier lesions such as um, consequences of severe uh, serostomia. And this replaced the calcium and phosphate loss from enamel and cementum. And uh, for manual plaque control uh, to help patients with disabilities, uh, not only using electric device and adaptive aids, like I previously mentioned, but also denture care, uh, how uh, the patient uh, taking care of the denture, like uh, removal of the denture while retiring, and then uh, cleaning and massaging the tissue under the denture at least once a day to increase circulation and enhance the health of this tissue. And um, uh, and also the patient should be instructed to brush and residential truly before and after soaking the and in immersion cleans. And uh, there is also a, a very important thing is to give counseling and education for the patient to brief, uh, to counseling about the preventive dentistry for the patient includes educa uh, giving them education and also a motivation. And using the tell, show, do, tell or explain the procedures and show or demonstrate the procedure and the uh, learner and then can do or practice this technique. And uh, so it requires the involvement of other health professionals, healthcare workers of caregiver and also the patient itself. And uh, I think that's all that I can share today. Uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity. And I really uh, need a comment from, for my lecture. Thank you, Professor Bedi and all. I stop share. You can. Linda, thank you so much. That was excellent. It really was very, very good. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to invite uh, um, questions from uh, Dr. Jacob and Dr. Callum. Jacob, Callum, any questions? Um, one question, Professor Linda, that I'd like to ask yeah. is um, it seems that in a lot of elderly, um, especially those who develop dementia, um, they require a lot of care from caregivers. And yeah. what's been your experience in helping those caregivers understand the importance of good oral health and how can they help the patient to achieve good oral hygiene and um, improve their oral health? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Colin, for your question. Uh, yeah, uh, the oral care for the dementia uh, patient, it is also uh, depends on the uh, severity of the dementia itself. If the dementia is uh, mild, maybe the patient can take care of their oral health care uh, by themselves. So uh, we just need to give them uh, education to the patient directly. But if the condition of dementia is uh, uh, severe, 
So it means that we cannot communicate with the patient. So we must include the caregivers or in Indonesia, maybe uh, the family is uh, very important uh, because not, uh, not all um, patients can afford to have a caregiver in our country. So maybe uh, the, the family who uh, take care of the patient, it's very important. So we give uh, uh, education for uh, the caregivers uh, during their visit. And uh, in our uh, dental hospital, we have uh, uh, what we call it uh, afternoon clinics. Uh, so it is uh, for uh, educate, not only, it is uh, like, um, like a meeting with the after they uh, after they got the treatment and then we we gathered a meeting uh, with the patient and also the caregiver and in that uh, we we show them the videos uh, or give them uh, instruction uh, uh, with videos for the for the caregiver and the patient. But in pandemic COVID nineteen. Uh, uh, it is stopped. So uh, we, because uh, also the the older uh, person uh, are afraid. To, some of them are afraid to go to our uh, dental hospital. So uh, we uh, give uh, using um, online uh, the, the the education of the or the instruction. We give it online for the sure. caregiver. Mm. Yeah. Sure, Linda. Thank you very much. Um, so some practical tips. It's very difficult to keep the, the mouth clean and daily care. Do you recommend sometimes an electric toothbrush or do you feel that um, manual toothbrushes are sufficient? Yeah, uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, uh, although uh, many journals said that it is <laughs> good to use the electrical toothbrush, but in my experience, uh, I am I'm, uh, favored to, uh, day to um, uh, modify their uh, toothbrush uh, uh, using uh, some of them using uh, rubber so that they can grip more easily. I think it is more uh, more comfortable for the patient and also mm -hmm. not, yeah and not all patient can afford to buy um, electric toothbrush mm -hmm. and it is mm -hmm. also yeah I think it's also to what to call it? Yeah, too, too strong. Yeah, the, the blood sure. from the electric. Yeah, it, it can. So one yeah, of the things, it. one of the things uh, we often have, Linda, is um, a situation where um, the the caregiver needs to be comfortable about putting their fingers in someone's mouth because. In some situation, we get choking because of uh, the dryness or the difficulty with mass fashion, or there's just quite a large debris gets stuck into people's mouths. How do you actually um, yeah. help the caregiver to feel comfortable about putting their fingers in somebody's mouth, either to remove some debris or to help with choking? Yeah. Uh, uh... Uh, thank you, Professor, for the question. Uh, the first of all, uh, we also uh, uh, give education for the caregiver to uh, to regulate the position of the patient. If the patient is uh, not uh, in the not uh, frail, so that uh, we can uh, ask them to uh, straight and then uh, a little lean. Uh, to the back and then uh, they can uh, uh, clean uh, using a, a soft ca a cotton, soft yeah. cotton uh, using their fingers. Okay, yeah. that, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, Jacob, is there any questions you would like to ask? Thank you, Prof. Vidi, and uh, thank you, uh, Professor Linda, for a uh, very uh, um, detailed explanation on, you know, how to take care. I just want to ask you, uh, Dr. Linda, now we know that uh, um, with the population aging and uh, better care being provided for those uh, who are disabled, people are living longer. And uh, 
one of the big issue that we encounter now is that people are not able to, these people are not able to seek treatment at the dental clinic, yeah. you know, because of their uh, functionality uh, uh, yeah. issues. So what do you think will be the future uh, approach towards this to provide care for these kind of patients? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Jacobs, for your question. Uh, I think uh, for this kind of patient that we would have the difficulties to go to the clinic, uh, it is also uh, done in our hospital. It is uh, we have a, a home care or home visit for the patient, uh, so that our team will go to the patient and then do the treatment. Uh, with the, also taking their equipment, but uh, as uh, uh, it is now, it is uh, in our dental uh, hospital. It is a uh, very. I think we just started this program, but uh, unfortunately, because of the pandemic uh, condition, uh, it is also stopped because uh, not uh, we cannot uh, go to the. A patient because they also don't want to uh, seek the treatment uh, in the COVID pandemic situation because they are afraid to because they are older person and they are compromised they they afraid that uh, it's high risk to get the yeah. infection yeah but in normal I, condition we will uh, we will continue the program yeah that that's really helpful can I ask all three of you uh, Jacob Callum and Linda yourself to start. Do you see a role for silver dynamine fluoride in, uh, in looking after uh, these very challenging groups? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah. Uh, maybe uh, Prof. Column or <laughs> Dr. Jacobs can ask, uh, can answer first. Okay, I'll be happy to yeah. give my opinion. Yeah. Um, I mean, mainly silver dynamine fluoride is being used more and more in children, but I definitely see an important role for it in elderly patients who have caries and who are not able to be treated easily in a dental chair um, in the conventional way. The silver diamine fluoride will arrest that caries. It'll mean that further intervention may not be needed. It'll control the situation. It should prevent pain from developing and I think apart from the aesthetics of it which you are going to get some black discoloration of the decay but apart from that it's an ideal sort of treatment in some of these patients. Yeah I, I agree with you Callum that's that. Uh, Jacob, Linda do you want to add anything to this discussion? Yeah I agree with uh, Professor Callum. Uh, I think uh, it is very uh, uh, useful in uh, older person uh, using of the sulfur diamond fraud, but I uh, I am uh, myself uh, not yet have experience in it. Sure. Uh, but in children, they they already have did it. But I think uh, it is uh, we can do it in the, for older person. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. No, I would recommend Jacob. Do you want to comment or? Um... Yeah, um, uh, as, as uh, mentioned by Prof. Uh, Linda just now that, uh, you know, you can provide domiciliary care uh, for those patients who can't come seek treatment in, in the dental clinic. So one of the criteria will be to use a technique that is less sensitive and uh, a, a, a less um, uh, invasive procedure. So in that sense also, this is, uh, you know, very, very helpful uh, a tool for uh, restorative uh, uh, it is. procedures. So yeah, the, yeah. you have yeah. a lot of uh, scope for it in, in, in the elderly patients as well as the, those who are uh, functionally disabled. It, no, I agree with you, Jacob, that's right. So uh, my experience, Linda, in uh, dementia or Parkinson's or fragile seniors, mm -hmm. um, but even in other special care groups, in children, in, with people with autism, uh, et cetera, there will be times when treatment is very challenging, but there will be also periods in their life where naturally things are quite stable and you will have uh, a, a moderate degree of access into their mouths. And it's yeah. in those periods uh, of time where I think silver dynamine fluoride is, is excellent and can help. 
Yes. And certainly the silver smart breast ration uh, should be considered um, yes. so that when, when things are stable and people are reasonably responsive, we can, um, as Callum says, we can arrest the decay. And if we are fortunate enough, we can add glass onema on top of that, the silver smart breast ration um, in those periods. I just wondered finally, Linda, whether you would like to make any comment or some reflections on those or other aspects of your lecture. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I cannot hear because uh, it is, uh, oh. and I, yeah, there's a disturbance of connection, I think. Okay, no, I was just wondering whether you wanted to make any comments, final comments uh, oh, okay. or, um, on, your, on your lecture uh, oh, before okay. we end. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Brady, that uh, in uh, my lecture, uh, I just want to uh, stressing that uh, it is very important for us to uh, have interprofessional uh, professional teams that uh, will uh, to do the treatment for this medically compromised patient because uh, it is not only the dentist to, to took care of the dental, but also other specialists uh, to also uh, will uh, contribute so that uh, our treatment uh, can help the condition of or, or the general condition of, of the patient and also we as a dentist can uh, can uh, like I said we can uh, have a screening for the patient uh, to overcome not or not to become more severe of the condition such as uh, the dysphagia condition maybe it the first uh, the first time it is the dentist who can um, uh, find the uh, the condition, and then after that we can uh, consult with uh, other specialists to overcome together of the condition. 